It is now time for our weekend cover story. And in a huge breakthrough in fertility research, scientists in Japan believe they will be able to grow human babies in a lab within the next five years. It does sound something of science fiction, really, but this uh, development brings new hope for, for thousands of Australian families struggling to conceive. For more, we're joined by Clinical Director of IVF Australia, Dr Manny Mangat, and today medical expert, Dr Nick Coatsworth in Canberra. Nick, I want to get to you first. Growing babies in a lab, uh, it's almost, well, I think it's inconceivable. Yeah. How, how would it work? Well, inconceivable. Well, there's a, there's a pun right there, mm. Clint. But uh, look, it, it is it is conceivable, and it seems that w people are doing it now. This happened in Japan. It happened with mice, and actually, two uh, stem cells were taken from different mice. Now, stem cells are cells that can uh, be directed to turn into any particular cell in the body. So, in this case, a sperm and an ova, and then uh, then they were allowed to sort of fertilize each other, do what they do, and uh, started growing a mouse in the lab. So that was the sort of background to the story. So, so you know, I mean, if it can be done in, in animals, you sort of remember 20 or 30 years ago, Dolly the sheep and human cloning. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're seeing that sort of thing happen in the fertility space as well. So Nick, these scientists are saying the technology will be ready for human testing within five years. Is that likely? Well, that would have to overcome significant regulatory hurdles and I'd love to hear from Dr Manny on this one but in Australia of course human embryo research can only occur up until till 14 days of life so uh, whilst uh, the technology might be there I suspect the regulatory barriers worldwide would push that out a little bit. Mm. Well Manny Mangat to you um, what, what to Nick's point there in regards to regulation because it is just such murky territory. Yes, um, I mean, it is pretty compelling and exciting research because it shows us what's possible in the space of stem cell and reproductive biology, as Nick said. However, what's important to mention here is that out of the 630 embryos that were created from those mice, only seven made it to live pups. And what that indicates is that the egg and embryo probably collects mutations and errors as it develops, therefore making it non-viable. The other thing to remember is that the human egg and implantation is very different from a mouse. There are, it's, it's much more complex with implantation. There are other factors like epigenetic um, imprinting and bonding and all the other things that happen in a human which we you know, can't just simply replicate from the mouse model. So even though the technology may be there, I think even the technology has a long way to go because in IVF in Australia, we practice that to exacting quality, safety and ethical standards with the patient and the offspring safety of utmost importance. So I think there's a long way to go with research, not only making this ever feasible, but also then research on the offspring to see what it's going to do to the health of the offspring. Science aside, what about the ethics? Do we even want to be doing this? Is it worth researching? Like, I mean, in a way, for a woman who's um, run out of eggs, at the moment, there's no other option besides using an right. egg donor. So using stem cells to create egg cells certainly may give women some hope. However, I think based on all the other you know, considerations, we're a long way away from testing the safety and the ethical considerations. You know, how far do we go? Yeah. Where do we stop? So I think there's, there's a lot more research to be done before we ever get there. Uh, Nick Coatsworth, to you, um, how do you feel? Are you, are you concerned? Are you excited? Oh, look, I, I mean, I think any scientific advance ha brings both concerns and excitement, and, and Manny's really eloquently outlined mm. uh, some, of the, some of the ethical concerns, the technological limitations. I mean, if, if for the, on the excitement side, though, if you look at... Uh, 10 to 20 years down the track and we're on the verge of colonising space and maybe we find out that humans can't actually gestate uh, themselves for nine months, something goes wrong in space and you can't actually have a baby in space. For example, does this allow the colonisation of space? And I know I'm sort of uh, looking a long way down the track here, but there are obviously some exciting uh, aspects to this. There's some more immediate possibilities, mm. but effectively there's also technological and ethical uh, problems as well and, and that's happening with science all the time and I guess the big issue in the world today is science is advancing so quickly that sometimes uh, we need to make sure our regulation and ethical discussions happen sooner rather than later. Mm.
Manny, as someone who has been through IVF, um, you know, we go through a lot to try and, and have a child. Uh, and I remember my doctor saying to me, you know, there's only so much we can do with the genetic material that we start with. You know, you only are born with so many eggs and they age. Is, is that where the real excitement is here, the, the, the fact that you could effectively create more eggs for a woman? Yes, I mean, that is definitely the most exciting aspect of, of all this research. However, um, remember, at this point, even in mice, only seven life pups from 630 yeah. embryos. That's far from an acceptable success rate in humans. That's a lot of disappointment, isn't it? Manny, yeah. right now in terms of uh, fertility research, there's been some other exciting advancements. Um, one we saw on 60 Minutes recently mm. involving a uterus transplant. Yes, that was that's amazing, isn't it? So. Um, uterus transplants have been done worldwide before this, but that was our Australian first uterus transplant. It went very well and um, our recipient lost her uterus after childbirth, which is heartbreaking. And some people are born without a uterus, some people actually require cancer treatment and can't then use their uterus. However, this woman had a, her, a uterus transplanted from her mother and the most exciting thing there is she's recently found out she's pregnant. Mm. So that's just right. simply amazing. And uh, Nick, where where do you think this could go? Where what do you think would be the best sort of use of this kind of new science? Well, I, th I think that the major issue that we've brought out today, as Manny suggested, is that the success rate at the moment of, uh, you know, gestating uh, ex corporally or out of the body is, is absolutely unacceptable. So th there's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Where we go immediately, though, stem cell research has been going on for a long time, where you take these cells and send them in different directions. So in the more immediate sense, we're talking about things like growing organs for transplant and so on and so forth. That's on the horizon. And uh, obviously in the IVF space with successful uterine transplants and, and taking babies to full term, that's an immediate uh, benefit of, of IVF uh, technology and reproductive technology that Australians can start benefiting from right now. Yes, Dr Manny, Dr Nick, thanks so much for your insight and time this morning. Well, with interest rates soaring and inflation remaining high, a growing number of new mums are being forced to return to work earlier than they'd planned. That's right. Jessica Villanueva intended to take one year off, but had to take up part-time work eight months after having her son just to ease the financial pressure on her family. She joins us now live from Melbourne. Jess, good morning. Thanks for your time. Um, what was it that led you to make uh, this decision to return to work early? Yes, as you said, our original plan was to take 12 months. Um, I did start to feel ready to return to work, so that was the main motivator. But as our mortgage and interest rates continued to rise, um, we wanted to make sure as a family that we were staying ahead of that. And so I made the decision, we mutually made the decision for me to return to the workforce part-time three days a week. There's so much going on in that first year of a baby's life. There can be lots of overnight wakes, uh, whether you're breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Um, the baby's changing all the time. How tough was it to make the call to get back to work? It was definitely a tough decision and one that took a lot of consideration and conversation between myself and my husband. Um, we're really lucky to have family support with childcare as well, which uh, eased that burden a lot. Um, but yeah, it definitely was a lot of long conversations about whether or not we would do that. And uh, we definitely know that we're privileged to be able to have even had that conversation rather than feeling like it was that I had to return to work. So we definitely know that we're lucky in that regard as well. Hey Jess, there's plenty going on at your place right now. I'm told that uh, your son has COVID, your husband's away for yeah. work. Um, how are you making things happen? You're juggling a lot right now. It has been a big week, that's for sure. Uh, my husband's been away in Germany on business. He flew home very late last night. <laughs> so he currently has our baby in another room so that I'm able to come and do this interview. <laughs> it's, um, it's definitely a juggle, that's for sure. Yeah, and you mentioned the childcare costs because also you've got to weigh back the cost of going to work and paying for childcare. And I think you have grandmothers stepping in to help with your child. I mean, what would we do without them? Exactly. It's a great question. And, you know, we're really lucky in that regard to have mm. that family support. Not a lot of families do have that. Mm. Um, you know, it would be amazing to see better subsidies for working families, for, you know, parents being able to return to the workforce and better support for that transition for many mums coming back to work as well. 
Um, but I've been really lucky in my workplace to have that internal work support as well from my boss and the owner of the company. Um, that certainly helped ease the transition too. Hey Jess, what are you hearing from other mums? It's, you know, it's been tough. There's, you know, out of my mother's group, there's 12 of us all together and the majority have already returned to work, wow. you know, within the year of our first year of our children's lives. Mm. And for those that haven't yet returned to work, they definitely intend to. Um, so, you know, I was raised by a stay-at-home mum back in the, you know, late 80s. <laughs> and I think, you know, those days are sort of sadly coming to an end mm. um, for most families. All right, Jess, uh, good luck with the rest of your motherhood journey and, and back to work and everything. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Put that husband to work for a bit. Yeah, That's what it's I his say. time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, it's his Jess. Turn now. Thanks, guys. Bye. Have a good day. Hey there today, fans. Sarah and... What's my name again? Oh my God. Carl. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching our YouTube <laughs> channel, though. Subscribe now for more news, special reports, and amazing Aussie stories. And Carl misbehaving, Whoa, of course. That never happens. Always happens. What's she talking about?